into a new series of how to build a life, focusing for the next, today and the next three weeks on the book of Colossians. Colossians is really a short letter from the Apostle Paul. And to go along with that, if you have not picked up a journal, there are still some journals in the back. And I just want to encourage you to pick up one of those journals. If you're in a community group, you can get one from one of your group leaders. If not, uh, there are some in the back. They're five dollars, and uh, every day there are some great readings, uh, scripture follow-ups from what we talk about on Sunday. There's some uh, place for you to make some notes. There's a place for you um, to go through some of the questions that are there. Uh, just some great reminders from the scripture that we take a look at on Sunday. And so pick up one of those journals if you haven't done that back in the back already. But we're going to focus for the next few weeks on how to build a life. I don't think that that's actually something that we think about a lot. Uh, we just, more often than not, just live our life. And we forget that there has been given to us a gift on how to build our lives. And the Bible has given us some guidance and directions on a proper way to build each one of our lives. And so a lot of the, the letters of Paul focus on that. And so we've chosen this one uh, along with uh, 12 other congregations that in this month of October, we're going to go through uh, how to build a life based on what Paul wrote here in the book of Colossians. We could go to any library or any bookstore and in every one of those, no matter how big or how small they are, there is usually a self-help section in there. And generally, the self-help section is one of the largest sections in a bookstore or in a library because each of us are looking for advice on how to build a life, although we might not be consciously thinking that what we're doing is building a life. We just think we are helping ourselves or self-help. The Bible has given us some clear indicators that each of us need to take and apply in our lives so that we can properly build a life that will be lasting and make an impression right here on earth as well as be able to live for all of eternity with Jesus, our Savior in heaven. If you were to take a look at any of those self-help books, though, you would see that the one thing that every one of them do is they focus on self because it is self-help. And I did just a very, very short, uh, very, very few minute research on some of the advice that self-help books would give to us. And so I'll save you the time of going to the library, and I'll just give you a few of those uh, things that are actually bad self-help advice. The first is, do what you love, and money will follow. You could leave here today and go do what you love, and money's not going to follow you. It just doesn't happen that way. But, that's self-help advice, but if you are living and walking in the will of God then God's provision is going to follow you. That might not always be money. And there's a big difference in those two. And that's why it's important for us to look at how to properly and biblically build a life. Another one here. Winning is everything. That's right. Winning is absolutely everything. Or UCLA football coach Harry Sanders said it this way. Winning isn't everything it's the only thing. Yeah. So if you were to take a look at some self-help books, what they want to tell you how to do is to win in life. Winning is everything. You have to win. You have to win. You have to win. You have to win. And the truth is, our winning here on this side of eternity is very minor compared to where we are going to spend our eternity. I don't want to win here I want to get to there. And so whatever it takes, I am willing to be the loser, if you will, here 
so that I can lift up the name of Jesus Christ. And winning is not everything. Jesus is everything. Another great bad self-help advice thing is visualize whatever you want and it will happen. If you can just put it in your mind, then everything around you begins to fall into place and it is going to happen. I think every one of us can say we've put some things in our mind that we have wanted and we're like, this is going to happen and it doesn't happen. And so here's then what happens. We become discouraged. We become depressed. And then we go back and find a different self help resource so that we can try to properly build our to build our lives and we forget that some of the self help uh, advice that we are getting does not align with the scriptures and it is giving us advice on how to build a life that cannot sustain itself another one here live for yourself and nothing else this is really the foundation of self-help. It's all about me. In fact, Toby Keith wrote a number one song that stayed at the top of the charts for a long time. I want to talk about me. I want to talk about I. I want to talk about number one, oh me, oh my. What I think, what I like, what I know, what I want, what I see. I worked in country radio when that song was at the top of the charts. It played every two and a half hours uh, on the radio at that time. Self-help advice is all about self Jesus said, forget about yourself. In fact, he told the rich, the, rich young, the rich young ruler to crucify yourself, to forget about yourself, and then come and follow me. The world says it's all about you. The truth is, it's not all about you. And we've raised generation after generation in our country, letting them think that life revolves around them. And they get to a certain place in their life and things begin to crumble because that's when they realize that the world doesn't revolve around them. The scriptures tell us the exact opposite. The world doesn't revolve around us. Instead, it revolves around the one who spoke the world into existence, God alone. And the last, and you've seen this, um, it's, it's on the back of, of big trucks. Those guys that buy those trucks that you have to get the ladder to, to get into. They often have this on their back glass. Whoever has the most toys wins. That's what the world tells us. If you have the most toys, then you win. Here's what I would say. He with the most toys still dies. That's the truth. It doesn't matter how many toys you have. It doesn't matter how much money you've invested in those toys. Those toys will only bring about that much joy into your life. And that joy is an unsustainable joy. Because when you get one toy, then they've invented a bigger toy. That, that one toy that you have then has to be traded in for the bigger toy, which brings about more debt. And then if you're just thinking about it in your mind, it isn't going to come to pass. And then you're going to... Do what you like with the toys that you have, hoping that money just falls into place. And then it doesn't happen. We become depressed. We become angry. We become withdrawn. And that's where the enemy begins to do his work on each of your souls. Because the world has told us how to build a life. And we have forgot that Jesus has given us exactly what we need in order to build a life that has absolutely nothing to do with the bad self-help advice that we get from the world. So this morning, I hope that we can begin to lay a foundation on how to properly build a life that aligns with what the Holy Spirit has given to us in the Scripture. Self-help is always about the self. The Scripture in building a life is always about God being glorified so that we can find true peace, joy, and contentment in each of our day-to-day -day lives. The reason that Paul wrote this letter to the Colossian believers was because there is some bad self-help, if you will, teaching that had crept into the church. In fact, there were other religions that had came in and attempted to 
take over this church and to inject into this church some of their very, very bad teachings. Now, Paul had never been to this church. This was a church that was started from one of Paul's converts. And Paul maintained a very close relationship with this church. And he spoke, he spoke the truth of God into this church time and time and time again. And Paul wrote to the Colossian believers and said, you have to reject the bad teachings that have come into your church, that have come into your life, that has tried to change who you are in Christ. And then you have to come back to exactly what the scriptures tell you and exactly live the way that Jesus encouraged each one of us to live. Something that I want to ask you to write down if you take notes. This is really a foundation that we are going to build from for the next couple of weeks. Spiritual growth. That's what Paul was encouraging the Colossian believers to, to produce is spiritual growth. And what Paul was saying is the growth that you have is not, or the, 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 um, the life that you want to live is not going to take place. And there's not going to be any spiritual growth from all of this bad teaching. But I want you to get back to the basics of who Jesus Christ is and who you are in Jesus Christ so that we can see spiritual growth. Spiritual growth means growing to know how God wants us to live. And the second part is so that we seek to please Him in all things. There's two things, two things that each of us as followers of Jesus Christ should want. One is growing to know how God wants us to live. And I think that each of us would have something of a desire like that in us because we've gathered here on a Sunday morning when we could have sought what self-help would tell us to do is to sleep in and relax when we have nothing else going on. But each of us have some type of a desire in us to grow in some way spiritually so that we can know how God wants us to live. The second part is a result of the first part, so that we seek to please Him in all things. Self-help seeks to please self. It's all about me. It's all about I. It's all about number one, oh me, oh my, what I think, what I like, what I know, what I want, what I see. Self-help is all about me. But as followers of Jesus Christ, we want to live so that we seek to please Him in all things in our life. So our foundation on how to properly build a life is all about spiritual growth. If you're not growing... You're dying. And my prayer for each of you, my goal for each of you is to grow spiritually because you're either growing spiritually or you're dying spiritually. And Paul was writing to the Colossian believers so that they would not die spiritually, but so that they would grow spiritually, so that they would grow to know how God wants them to live so that... They seek to please Him in all things in their life. So take a look with me, if you will, in Colossians chapter 1. We're going to start reading in verse 3 this morning. Colossians 1, verse number 3. Paul actually is beginning this letter to the Colossian believers um, with um, a word of thanksgiving or with a word of... Um, with a word of a prayer. And he's saying, this is my prayer for you. He's addressed it. He said, I'm in prison. I'm in chains. I'm not able to get over there to see you. I haven't been to your church, but I've heard that there's some false teachings coming in. And so I give thanks for you and I pray for you. And he picks up in, in verse three, we'll pick up with what Paul is saying here. We always thank God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all of the saints. The faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about it in the word of truth, the gospel, that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. Did, did you catch what Paul said there? That is a phrase that we could just skip right over and it, it could mean nothing to us. But Paul said to us in writing his letter on how to build a life to the Colossian believers, all over the world, the gospel 
is bearing fruit and growing. See, Paul knew you're either growing or you're dying spiritually. And he says, my prayer for you is that you grow. Because he goes on in the next little phrase there, just as it's been doing among you. You, since the day that you heard it and understood God's grace in all of its truth, you learned it from Ephraim, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. In other words, build a life worthy of the Lord. Paul's telling them how to build a life here. Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has glorified or qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For He has rescued us from the domination of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Paul is telling the believers how to build a life. And he is saying in Jesus Christ... You have everything that you need. Absolutely everything that you need. And Paul is using a couple of words in verse 9, 10, and 11 here that stick out to us if we are to take a look at his writings. He uses the word all and he uses the word every several times here to say in Jesus, and then he gets into this in the end of chapter 1, He he says that in Jesus, there is everything that you need. You don't need anything else. You don't need, in essence, or in in other words, self-help stuff. You don't need more self-help resources in your life. You don't need more this. You don't need more that. You just need more Jesus in your life. Paul says in verse 9, notice here, all spiritual wisdom and understanding. It's in Jesus Christ. All wisdom. And spiritual understanding. In verse 10, he says, so that you can please him in all respects. Again, using the word all here. And then in verse 10, at the end, he says, bearing fruit in every good work. Verse 11, he says, strengthened with all power. Verse 11, at the end, he says, for the attaining of all steadfastness and Patience. You see, in Jesus, there is everything that you need. And if you want to properly build a life that can sustain the storms and the tribulation that comes at us in this world, then you have to build that life on Jesus Christ. Jesus must be your foundation. And then once you've begun that work, then we can begin to grow spiritually so that we grow to know how God wants us to live so that we then just naturally seek to please Him in all things. That's how to properly build a life. So this morning you may have gathered here and you just may be exhausted from life itself. Life itself will beat you up. It attempts to tear you down if you're not building on Jesus Christ. You see, what the enemy wants us to do is he wants us to build our life on so many other things. So many other things. And then he wears us out until we just get to the point to where we don't have any strength We don't have any more energy, and then we begin to withdraw, and it leads to a multitude of different things, and we start to fill our lives with so many other things that have no meaning and are not lasting, and they seek to simply destroy us. Paul knew what Jesus said in John 10.10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy But Jesus said, I have come that you may have life to the full or life more abundantly. 
Paul says, you have to build a life on Jesus Christ and absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing else. Because all we need is in Jesus Christ. And in order to build a life, it requires a spiritual understanding of what God is doing in and wants to do through each one of us. That is our foundation of spiritual growth so that we're growing in Him. We have to have some type of spiritual understanding or understanding of what Jesus is doing in every single one of us. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, Paul was writing to Timothy who was with Paul when he was writing this letter. He says, Timothy, think about what I'm saying and the Lord will give you understanding of all of this. Paul is saying to Timothy, I am telling you what God is doing and what God, how God is working. And you're not understanding this, Timothy. And if you will stop and think about what I am saying to you, then God will give you a gift. And that is a gift of understanding. There are times in our life that we just scratch our head and we just don't understand things. Paul would say to us, think about the words that he has given to us so that we can grow spiritually and have some understanding in our life. You see, we need spiritual understanding. Understanding of Jesus Christ in our life. And until we fulfill that void in us, we will never understand Our lives will never have any meaning because we don't understand the meaning of life. The meaning of life is in Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul later says uh, at the end of chapter 1 to the Colossian believers, to the church there that's allowed false teachings to creep in. D.A. Carson is a great writer, a great, great writer. Uh, And he he writes uh, several several books about the, the, the Western church and how we have allowed false teachings to to creep in and allowed the enemy to lure us away from the heart, the mission of the church. In one of his books, he says, In the Western church, the knowledge of God declines while our fascination with techniques and fads increases. Knowledge of God is on decline while our fascination with techniques and fads is slowly increasing. I would say now it's probably quickly increasing. We see this in churches everywhere. We've got this ministry. We've got this ministry. We've got this ministry. We've done this and we've done this. And when churches are dying spiritually, they start grasping for this program and this program and this program. If we can just buy this book or we can buy this resource, we can take it and we can apply it. When what they are doing is grasping for techniques and fads instead of grasping for the heart of God himself and having spiritual understanding. I'm thankful that our leaders a few years ago said and made a conscious decision. We are not seeking fads and we are not seeking the best techniques. We are seeking the heart of God and what God wants to do inside of each one of us. You see, it's the exact same for every one of us as it is in the church. We want the latest fad or we want the latest technique or we want the latest self-help advice or we want this or this or this or this or this. And then we forget that the longing of our heart is for more and more of Jesus Christ. We can't grow and build a life without having Jesus as the foundation of our life. We must hunger for more of God than more of anything else in this world. And if that hunger can be cultivated inside of you, then and only then will you properly build your life. See, the problem in the world today, the problem in the culture today, and the problem in the church today is that we often seek everything other than Jesus. And Jesus said, if you seek me, if you seek me, you will find me. We're trying to fill our life up with all of this stuff that has no lasting meaning when compared to eternity. When Jesus is already there preparing a place for us if we will seek more and more of him. Billions of dollars, billions of dollars 
are spent in this world today, in this world today, going to conferences, buying the latest books, subscriptions for coaches, magazines, and websites, and counselors, trying to build a life. When Paul says in the book of Colossians, here's how you build a life. Here's how it's done. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. Without starting with Jesus, everything you're building will eventually crumble. Everything, absolutely everything will crumble. And billions of dollars in this world are wasted because we are not seeking Jesus Christ. Our only hope Our only hope is if we are seeking God and then begin to grow spiritually. And again, spiritual growth means growing to know how God wants us to live so that we will seek to please Him in all things. And so if this is true, and if this is what Paul has said, You have to have Jesus as the foundation of your life in order for you to build a life, a true life that is going to be sustained here on earth and will last through all of eternity. If you're going to do that, you've got to build on Jesus Christ and then you have to begin to grow spiritually. Then what we have to ask ourselves is, how do we grow spiritually? How do we grow spiritually? You know, there are very few fads There are very few latest trends that tell us how to grow spiritually. Lots of people will tell us, you need Jesus, you need Jesus, you need Jesus. But then we forget we've got to grow in Jesus. We've got to grow spiritually because you're either growing or you're dying. One of the two. You're either getting closer to God or you're getting further away from God. You can't push pause and think, I'm just going to meander here for a little bit. A boat without a motor going is going to drift somewhere. A life that's not growing spiritually is drifting further and further away from God. And so you're growing or you're dying. The good news is you get to pick. But we've got to ask ourselves, how do you grow spiritually? I want to give you very short, very quick, six ways to grow spiritually so that you can leave here this morning and take some things and apply them this afternoon and in the days ahead so that you are growing spiritually so that you want to know how God wants you to live, so that you are then able to please Him in all things in your life. How is it that we grow spiritually? The first thing is you need to read and meditate on the Word of God. You have to read and meditate on the Word of God. So many times we get upset because we want to hear from God. We get frustrated, we get aggravated. I just need to hear from God. You have heard from God if you've read the Bible. God has spoken already. It's recorded from Genesis to Revelation. And what you have to do is get into the Word of God, the words that God has already spoken, so that you will be able to grow spiritually. You will never, ever, ever grow spiritually if you're not reading the Word of God. It's not possible. And you're either growing or you're dying. And so if God's word is not a part of your routine, you're not growing spiritually and you are dying spiritually. If you want to grow spiritually, if you want to build a life that is lasting, you have to do it by starting with the word of God. And this is the first one that I mentioned for this very reason. It all starts here. God has spoken. It's been given to each one of us. And you have to read and meditate on the word of God in order to grow spiritually. So if you want to grow, read and meditate on the Word of God. Paul wrote in his prayer here in the beginning of his letter to the Colossian believers that they would have all understanding. All understanding starts here. This is where God has revealed Himself to mankind. He continues in His revelation to each one of us today. He has spoken and He still speaks today. But it begins with The Word of God. Now, I want to caution you here. Don't go buy a book about the Bible. That's the worst thing you can do. Go buy a Bible. Don't buy a book about the Bible. Buy a Bible. 
Because what you are reading is what God has spoken to somebody else. When God wants to speak to you through His Word. So, to grow spiritually, you have to read and meditate on the Word of God. The next thing you have to do is you have to study it. You have to study the Word of God. You can't just go to math class and learn a, bit, a little bit of multiplication and division, addition and subtraction, and become a math genius so that you can grow mathematically. That is an aid for you. But in order to grow mathematically, you have to study it. It's the same with the Word of God. We tell our kids when they're growing up, you've got to study, you've got to study, you've got to study. But yet when we become adults, we stop studying. Why is that? Because the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come to help you build a life. To help you build a life that is full, that is abundant and overflowing. And it can only happen when you read and meditate on the Word of God. And then you take it a step further and you study it. So maybe this is the place that you say, okay, I'm going to study a certain book of the Bible. The book of John or the book of Mark or whatever that book is. And maybe you say, I'm going to study one or two or three books over the course of the year. And that's where then you go a step further after you've read it, and then you buy resources to help you study the Word of God. You can't come to church on Sunday morning and listen to a sermon that's about 30 minutes and expect to grow spiritually saying, oh, I've studied the Word of God. No, you haven't. You've sat and listened to somebody talk for 30 minutes to hopefully encourage you to go and study the Word of God more. It's the same way in school. You can't go listen to a lecture from a, from a teacher or a professor and think, oh, I've got it, let's get right to the test. You've got to study it. The same is true with the Word of God. So I would encourage you to read and meditate on the Word of God and then say, I'm going to now study the Word of God. The next, the third thing, if you want to grow spiritually, you have to pray. You have to spend time in prayer. Now, some of you may say, okay, I can read the Bible I can study the Bible, but prayer is tough. You know what? Prayer is tough. The discipline of prayer is tough. But here's what I hope that you can catch this morning, is God loves you so much that He died for you, and He wants to be in relationship with you. It's not that you accept Jesus' blood for the remission of your sins, and then that's completely, I mean, it's over. It's signed, sealed, and delivered. God wants to be in relationship with you because that's how much he loves you. God is a God that still speaks today. He's a God that still guides us and directs us, gives us joy, gives us peace when those storms of life are coming, gives us in the midst of chaos just this, uh, this, this presence that rests with us, that gives us this sense of, of being content so that we can continue walking with him. That only comes into our life in prayer. I encourage you to be in prayer. Paul wrote to the believers in Colossians, I hope that you have, or my wish is for you to have all understanding. He said in verse 9, I'm praying for you to have all understanding. The way that you get all understanding is to ask God for that understanding. The way that you get wisdom is to ask God for wisdom. The way that you ask God is to do it in prayer. Is to do it in prayer. Growing spiritually means that we grow to know how God wants us to live. It starts by reading and meditating on the Word of God, studying the Word of God, and then in prayer, we gain this understanding and we gain this wisdom that we wouldn't otherwise have. If you want to grow spiritually, prayer must be something that is a part of your daily routine. It's no different from any relationship here on earth. If you want to grow a relationship with somebody, the way that you do it is spending time with them and, 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 and having a conversation with them. And prayer is that way with God. It's just having a conversation with God. Now you probably think, and you would probably say, hey, God doesn't talk to me. It's because you won't slow down enough and sit long enough to give God the opportunity to say something to you. If you will sit with God, if you will push pause on the world so that you can sit and spend time with God, 
He will speak to you. It's not in an audible voice. It's just in this still, small presence of a voice that God will speak to you. But you have to slow down enough and sit enough for God to say something. Here's a danger that we have in prayer sometimes. Is when God speaks something to us, we think, man, I've got it. And we take off and we go. But we forget that prayer is a conversation with God. God doesn't reveal everything to us all at once, all of the time. It comes in bits and it comes in pieces so that we know that we have to continuously rely on Him. Prayer is a process. Prayer is a relationship. And it grows over time. So read and meditate on the Word of God. Study the Word of God. Pray. Spend time with God. And the fourth is participate in church. Participate in church. We began this journey in our journals in September talking about relationships. The reason that we did relationships before we started talking about how to build a life is in hopes that you would catch in, the, in those four weeks that God has blessed us with relationships. Adam wasn't enough on his own. God blessed him with the relationship of Eve. And since then, God has been blessing men and women with relationships here on earth. Not just husband and wife relationships, but friends and family. And we need relationships to grow spiritually. It's a requirement to grow spiritually. The only people that are going to encourage you to, to uh, grow spiritually are people that are in the church. If you are in a church that is not encouraging to grow spiritually, then you need to find a new church because that's a part of the purpose of the church is to glorify God and encourage and lift up the believers to grow spiritually so that we can seek more of God, so that we then can seek to please Him in everything that we do. The church's purpose is for each other. And when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, He placed you in the church. Listen, the Scripture is clear. The Scripture is clear on this. Jesus died for the church. And it upsets me when people say, I don't want anything to do with the church. Because Jesus is coming back for the church. It's clear. Now the church is made up of all the believers. We can't vote you in the church. We can't kick you out of the church. Because it's his church. He died for it. It's his. And so he's the one that gets to decide who's in and who's out. Not me. Not you. It's God's church. And he has placed you in the church as a follower of his, so that you can be a part of a body of believers that are encouraging each one another. And so I encourage you to participate in the church. Now, I am not blind, and I am not stupid. The church is made up of human beings. And if you're looking for a perfect church, you're not going to find it, because there are no perfect human beings. This one isn't perfect. The one down the road isn't perfect. The, the, any that you pass on your way to church, on the way to this place this morning, none of them are perfect churches, because we're all human beings. But our goal in the church, our purpose, one of our purposes in the church, is to encourage one another to grow spiritually, to encourage one another whenever it seems like we're ready to give up when we are building this life that God wants us to be. We have to grow spiritually. And the way that we grow spirit, one of the ways that we grow spiritually are through the relationships that God has blessed us with. Now, you're either growing or you're dying. You're growing or you're dying. You get to make the decision on that. We need relationships in order to grow, though. The next thing. So we're studying, or we're reading and meditating on the Word of God. We're studying the Word of God. We are praying. We're participating in the church that God has placed us in. And the next one is something that I want to encourage you in because if, for me, it is a big, big help. I want to encourage you to journal. I want to encourage you to journal. If it's picking up one of these orange journals back there, um, this is what I would say is a journal on training wheels. And that's why we get them for you. Uh, this is just something so that you can get off the training wheels and you'll be able to ride on your own in hopes of getting into a journal where it's just you and God. The reason that I, that I journal is because I'm forgetful. And if I don't write things down, I forget about it. It just comes naturally if your last name is Chambliss. You've got a memory that lasts about this long. 
And then when there's something else flashy over here, ooh, flashy. And then you forget about what was over here. And then there's something flashy over here, and it's gone, and you forgot there was even a right side. Journaling, though, journaling, though, helps you remember what God is saying to you and what God is doing in each one of your lives. If you will slow down enough, and I brought two of my journals, um, if you will slow down enough so that you can just sit with God, it will surprise you what God does in your life. I promise you. I promise you. I don't like writing. I'm not, I'm not a big writer when, as it comes to um, when I went into journaling. Um, but what I've done is I begin to record the things that God is doing in my life and in, the, in some of your lives and in the life of this church, others that are around me. So that on days when the enemy comes at me, I can go back and I can say, no, I remember on this date, at this time, this is when I saw you heal somebody. Or this is when I saw you change somebody's life. And I can go back and I can say, God is a God that still works. He might not be working in this moment that I can see, but I know that he's there. I encourage you to journal. And then how many you fill up over the year, or maybe you just fill up one. You can go back at the end of the year, and you have a record of all that God has done. And it's amazing. It is amazing to look back and see all that God has accomplished. Some things, it's easy for us to forget. Very easy to forget. But if you've written it down, you've got a record of what God is doing in your life and in others around you. Some days I journal prayers. Some days I journal my frustrations with God. Some days I journal joy. Some days I journal what God has done in your lives. I've journaled miracles that I have seen and has been reported. I journal what God is doing so that I have a record and I can go back and I can rejoice and grow spiritually. Journaling is a great way to grow spiritually, and I encourage you to do that. And the last thing, the sixth thing, so we're, we're reading and meditating on the Word of God, we're studying the Word of God, we're praying, we're participating in church, we're journaling, and the last way that I would encourage you to grow spiritually is to give it all away. Give it all away. Self-help teaches you to become a hoarder. I want to hoard all of this knowledge that I have. I want to hoard all of this understanding that I have because it's for me and it is to help me. The scriptures teach us to take that and give it all away. Don't hoard it up to yourself. Self-help would teach us in order to build our life, get all the money that you can and then just sit on it. Hoard all of that money up to yourself and then just sit on it. Jesus said to the rich young ruler that that's not at all what you should do. That's not how you grow spiritually. Jesus said to the rich young ruler in Luke chapter 18, verse 22, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Jesus said, give it all away. Give it all away. And then, he says, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow. Jesus said to the rich young ruler, if you want to grow, give it all away. Give it all away. Because as followers of Christ, as followers of Christ, we know that God gave it to us to begin with. He gave it to us. And so what we then have to do is give it to other people. God has entrusted us with knowledge. He's entrusted us with understanding. He's entrusted us with financial resources. He's entrusted us with means. He's entrusted us with relationships. And what we have to do is give it all away. Give it all away. And the scripture is clear. He will give back to us, shaken down, pressed together, more than we ever gave away to begin with. So if you want to grow, take whatever you have, Give it all away. Give it all away. And trust that the God who gave it to you to begin with is going to give you more than you gave away. If you want to grow spiritually, you have to read the Word of God. And you have to meditate on the Word of God. You have to study the Word of God. You have to pray. You have to participate in the church. You need 
to journal and you have to give whatever you have away. Because you're either growing spiritually or you're dying. Paul said to the believers, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and of the love that you have of all of the saints. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. If you want to build a life here on earth that is a life that is lasting, that is a life that will, sus- will sus- be sustained through the storms of all of life, then you have to build a life on, G- on the foundation of Jesus Christ and the understanding that he would give to us so that we can grow spiritually so that then we are able to please him in all things. This morning... Maybe you're just a little discouraged about how things have been going in your life. and You feel like you haven't made any progress or you haven't been building a life that's a life on the foundation of Jesus Christ. This morning, I want to encourage you to just simply surrender to God. That's it. You just have to surrender to God. And then after you surrender to God, then you begin to grow spiritually in these six things that we've talked about this morning. But it always begins with surrendering to God and surrendering to Him alone. How do you build a life? It starts with surrender to God, and then you begin to grow spiritually.